Hello there, my name is Jake and I have run the Dragon of Icefire Peak Adventure, which is a playthrough that you can actually find right here on this channel. And today we are going to specifically talk about Axholm. It's one of the last quests that your party will go on. It's something I enjoyed. I feel like, uh, actually, I, this one went really smooth and I am joined today by my good friend, Josh, who played Sir Marcus of House Winterburn. Hello, good to be here. Just a heads up. This is going to contain spoilers. Obviously, we're going to go through this adventure pretty in-depth, talk about things that worked for us, things that might not have worked for us. So if you're a player, please just step away now, and maybe after you do the quest, you could watch it. But uh, otherwise, don't watch this unless you're running the game or just interested in it. So be a good player. If you're a player, you can hit the like button on your way out. Though. <laughs> yeah, or dislike. <laughs> <laughs> First things first, let's take a look at the quest card because anytime you're running an adventure, it's a good idea to understand what information your players have because they kind of drive the action. So Josh, would you please do the honors, good sir? Embedded in a mountain south of Phandalin is the ancient dwarven fortress of Axholm, which has been sealed for years. If a dragon attack is imminent, the people of Phandalin can evacuate to take refuge in Axholm. To that end, someone needs to open the fortress and make it safe for habitation. Once you accomplish these tasks, return to Townmaster Wester and collect a reward of 250 gold pieces. Yeah, so basically Axholm is an abandoned dwarven fortress that's kind of just been empty for years because the restless spirit of a moon elf ambassador named Vildara turned into a banshee. Now is hanging out in Axholm which we're going to talk a lot about Vildara later on as far as like how to run as a Banshee, but we're talking about NPCs. She's kind of the only one, and she's got a bit of an interesting story. If you're familiar with Banshees, which we actually have a creature feature, you should watch that video too, which is probably going to be a card somewhere. Josh is trying to find it. Eventually you'll find it. She tried to stir up like some civil unrest with the dwarves and like, they imprisoned her once they started to figure this sort of thing out. And, you know, they wanted the elves to come get her and she tried to escape, killed a couple of guards, and then it got really messy, really nasty. All that information is actually in the adventure, but this is now her turf. And that's kind of the way that you would role play her. You could do make, make that affect her combat decisions, that sort of thing. If there is dialogue, uh, Banshees are a little, you know, they got more than a few screws loose. And that could be fun. She's aware as the moment the, the characters arrive because they have that detect life feature. So mm -hmm. like, it's her show. You know, a lot of time when you look at something like this, and you're, you're like, okay, this is a really cool fortress, it, really defensible. It, it's a perfect place for someone to set up camp. So why hasn't anyone set up camp there? And this is your reason. You, you know, like it's if, too if loud. You have, yeah, <laughs> exactly. If you have players that that are you know trying to analyze everything, be like this doesn't make sense. Like they would have, they would orcs would have taken over this place. You know, they they wouldn't be causing trouble over at the loggers camp or anything like that. They'd be here. Well, you know, maybe they don't want to deal with a banshee. No, I don't like loud sounds to begin with. <laughs> like that scene in Dumb and Dumber. You want to hear the most annoying sound in the world? I was like, no, I don't. But Vildara the Banshee is not alone in Axholm. And part of the lore of what happened is some of the dwarves that were here got turned into ghouls. And that's something that you need to familiarize yourself with. And one thing that's notable about ghouls, Josh, is... um. They stink. It's a place where Jake and I would hate to go with our H HSP tendencies. Too yes. loud, too oh. smelly. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure there'd be some texture problems too, you know, just, just to throw that in as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but jokes aside, I think that the smell is, is really, a, it's a good way to, to show and don't tell because this place was abandoned a long time ago. Why does it still smell? The thinking humanoids character is going to be weary of that they're going to be like mm, what's going on here that there's something smelly is that the smelly smell that smells smelly and that's that's for <laughs> the all smelling you smell. <laughs> <laughs> whenever you edit this that'll be the the gif that <laughs> comes up on the screen just anchovies <laughs> okay 
And then the last feature of the area really is just loud noises, such as like like breaking down the doors, screeching metal, that kind of thing. That really kind of all would be loud enough to alert the ghouls that something is going on. So the Banshee and the ghouls aren't necessarily working together, even though they coexist here. It's not like she's giving them inside information. So if the if the players actually are being stealthy, that's going to be a big advantage for them going through this adventure. This is the part of the video where we normally go through all of the quest goals. And in here, it's it's pretty simple. You're just going to clear the stronghold of any threats. You are trying to make this stronghold right and safe for the good people of Fandalen. And, uh... <laughs> You know, that, that's, it's pretty straightforward. Just clean it up, make sure it's safe. And even the travel to the location is pretty simple. It's like, it's, they just say it's about a day's journey. There's like no encounters planned along the way. If you want to throw something there, you want to throw a cryovane roll, you want to plan a cryovane encounter. You can do all those kinds of things if you wanted, depending on what kind of tones you're setting for your game. Yeah, quest goals, travel to the location. Quite simple. Boy, wouldn't it be interesting to have a cryovane encounter at Axholm? Being like, you know, like, you think this is safe, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, right. cave and stuff like that. <laughs> so when you get to Axelm, it's like this, this big, locked up, gated facility. For us, it was kind of easy to get in because we had Daisy, and Daisy was small, so she could just kind of squeeze through tight spaces and get in there. But there had to be other ways to, to get in, I guess maybe just not as quiet. There are other entrances to Axholm. Um, searching for it, they say, it gives you a DC 15 perception check, and that's to find some stone chimneys that stick out from the mountainside. You know, earthquakes blocked off most of it to all but tiny sized creatures, which actually, there are some sturges, which are, as if you've watched the series, you know how much I love sturges, <laughs> but they've found their way into Axholm as well. But their two chimneys are big enough for the group to use. Uh, and they actually lead to sections A21 and 23, which is on the second floor, which actually would have been a very different experience, Josh, than you and the rest of the pumped up kids had when going through Axe Home. And then climbing down those chimneys, it's just a DC 10 athletics check. And then there's just a little little chance to slip and fall. Yeah. A little tax on your resources. That's spiders, right? That's the spider room. Yeah. If you That's fall, actually, too, room. it's loud enough to let them know lunch Oof. is arriving. <laughs> Yeah, you would have actually had happen to you what Marcus did to those ghouls. <laughs> you fall down the chimney. <laughs> yeah. You're like, oh man, like why are there like seven she lobes just staring at me? <laughs> and that is why you don't get a bunch of people to go down the same chimney. Yes, exactly. <laughs> bottleneck. Santa Claus has it right. <laughs> One yeah. at a time. Absolutely. <laughs> So Josh, you and your group went through the first floor and I actually don't remember if I did this properly or not, because I do remember that when Daisy was like moving the winch to open up the portcullis, it was rusty. And I think I may have had this like moment to scare you guys a little bit, like there was like a nice screech. But the reason why that is significant is that the ghouls really are the biggest threat for the first floor. <laughs> if you're loud, they're actually all supposed to that an ambush for you in A4, which they say they're supposed to have three ghouls plus three ghouls per party members. You would have had a dozen of these things. Just like you would have walked and be like, why does it smell so bad in here? It's like, oh, oh God, oh no, here we go. Yeah, <laughs> and you would have had a very different experience than the one you had. Yeah, different is the correct word. <laughs> it would have been fun, but yeah, that that stacks rapidly. You know, it, I can't imagine that with a bigger party, you know, three and three and three and three. Like that's gets kind of brutal depending on what kind of classes you're playing with. Yeah, and ghouls are nasty because they have the ability to paralyze a creature potentially up to a minute. Now it's only a DC 10 constitution saving throw, but if you are constantly having to make that saving throw eventually you're going to make have a bad roll one of my favorite comments we ever had was on our playthrough because we did do the playtest tunnel fighter fighting style for marcus you owned these ghouls like they <laughs> you were fighting them in the throne room which is down in a14 which all the ghouls are in a5 a14 a19 and a26 and in the fight in a14 the ghouls from a26 come down the chimney one of my favorite comments on her playthrough was like, wow, 
bring Marcus with you if the zombie apocalypse ever happens. <laughs> <laughs> because he's just like standing there using Sentinel, Polar, Master, and Tunnel Fighter, <laughs> stopping every single ghoul that came down there. Almost one-shotting all of them too. It was crazy. Yeah, but stopping all of their movement. Yeah, that was uh, that was a little little ridiculous. I always describe that scene as if you've ever played Super Smash Bros. The the hammer, the you know, like that's that's what was happening. It was probably meant to be more stressful than it was for us, but yeah, it was definitely even even then it was still stressful to an extent, just because it's it's like I know that they could paralyze us, and there are twelve of them. So if I miss and one hits me and I'm paralyzed, Marcus is paralyzed for a minute, I'm probably going to die. And then it's, you know, what happens? (laughs) Things can snowball very rapidly. Just because things can go one way doesn't mean your encounter wasn't deadly. Don't let that mess mess you up for future encounter planning and things just because of that. If Marcus would have missed, just missed one attack and they get up to him and happen to hit him and he fails. Now all of the rest that come behind him, he's paralyzed. So now they're swarming the rest of the party, doing their thing, auto critting because of (laughs) paralyzation. Like, yeah. And all of a sudden they'd be like, oh crap, there's, we might have a TPK on our hands. A lot of DMS and we've, we've talked about this in in videos dedicated to this, but I think a lot of DMS forget about the randomness aspect of this game. And when the dice roll in their players' favor on something that was a good encounter, they're just like, oh, well, I, I can't challenge my players. Let me, I'll throw 24 out of them next time instead of, instead of 12. Too and it's, like, too yeah. Weak, yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, that's, that's where your TPK came from. And that was another reason why I was like, no, like, I, I understand why you feel bad about this, Josh, but no, <laughs> this is something Marcus is designed to do. Have your moment. It is what it is. <laughs> I'll get you on cryovane. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think the main advice for this section, if you haven't already figured that out, is, is just once the fight with the ghouls starts, the other ones are going to hear that and they're all going to come in swarming as if it was World World War Z. Even if they finish all of them in, in A14 or whatever zone when they go to leave, why are we still in initiative? Oh, because there's another one right behind this corner. You know, like it, it's... Feel yeah. free to surprise them with that. After that, I mean, after you, you get rid, done with all the ghouls and all that kind of stuff, I mean, it, it's really just window dressing. It's just telling the story, describing the scenes, read all the descriptions in there. I think there's like a little like toilet thing in A15 that my character fell into. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, I've just I've had fun with it. <laughs> yeah. The next big threat really that you guys encountered was the Banshee in section A24, which is in the second floor, which is called the Haunted Hall. And there are instructions for how to use the Banshee. I think the best method is to just use the incorporeal movement feature to pass through the walls, potentially isolate party members. If you could get them kind of chasing their tail a little bit, that would be wise. Of course, you're going to, you know, do your scream right away. And also that the horrifying visage Poor Landor. Landor got hit by all of that. Yeah, he had a rough time. Maybe it's a Michael thing. I don't think he does well with Banshee. (laughs) This is another thing that ties into our our last conversation where is this a deadly encounter? Like, I don't know. A single Banshee could be a deadly encounter. What do you have to roll DC 13? If you're having a bad night, it's a D20. D20s are swingy. It's not like you have a, a bell curve working in your favor. You, you might roll well, you might roll poorly, and, and that's just how it is. Typically, the party's either going to first face the ghouls and or the Sturges in the first floor or the spiders. And so the Banshee is going to make the third encounter much more difficult because now yeah. you guys you fought the ghouls. I don't remember what exactly how much spell slots Landor used. <laughs> I don't know. Probably not too much, but he dropped to zero hit points. So now you're using resources to get him back up into some kind of fighting shape. And when you ended up going in to fight the spiders, that really ended up being much more deadly than I had thought it would be. Yeah, we we were depleted at that point. I think that's that's one of the things that makes this uh, this quest such a strong one. Like, yes, you could take rests. I don't remember if we took a rest or not. I'm sure we took one. If your group is the 15 minute adventuring day group, like it just kind of flips that on its side because you're you're not getting away with that. You're going to have to do two of them. You're going to get beat up. You're going to get to the third and it's challenging. You know, e- even if each individual encounter isn't bad, the stacking of the three of them, it's tough. 
The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. The nice thing too, like just looking at the map here is like, that's a really good area for a Banshee because of that incorporeal movement. There are plenty of spaces for her to go into this room. Oh, now I'm in this room or not, you know, and then just kind of like sneak up on you. That's really cool, especially if you have a party that's super strong or something like that and you, you want to challenge them, you could easily do that and isolate them just by having the Banshee move between rooms. Definitely. And you just have the Banshee's head sticks out of them. Oh, oh, there's still two of them. Like, oh, if she's trying to bait us, it's like, no, she's just trying to see if there's only one of you. <laughs> you know, it could be that kind of a thing. Yeah. But that's up to however they interpret it. So talking about the spiders, that was the last fight that we had. And your group happened to come up on the staircases that are located in section A22. But if they entered through the chimney area, they're going to come in A21 or A23, which actually is kind of interesting because the entrances there are five feet wide and giant spiders are, are big. So you kind of can pigeonhole them and control some of the, the battlefield there. But when you guys walked in, I rolled a natural 20 on their stealth check to hide from you. So much more deadly than I thought it would be. They say to put in three giant spiders plus one per party member. So you were fighting six of these things. That's like a the monsters know what they're doing kind of kind of thing. I don't yes. know if that blog is still a thing, but like if spiders are sneaky, you know, and they're they're using all the tools that they have, it's probably going to be kind of difficult. And I would say that it absolutely was. That, that was probably the most, even though we had someone drop during the Banshee fight, I think the spiders was the most stressful out of all of them. But it was, it was also the last yeah. one and we were depleted out of most of our resources by then. And it's interesting, too, because you look at the ghouls and giant spiders, they're both challenge rating one. And based on the numbers of the ghouls, you would think like, OK, that's the more deadly encounter. And it is the more deadly encounter. But with things like each one of these giant spiders has a web attack, which recharges. So there's things like restraining, there's poison, uh, which can eventually even lead to paralyzation, which is a little bit later on. But there's this has the potential to really, really wreak havoc on the group if things just go a certain way don't I be afraid to dial into just how deadly it can be because i think it, the stress is what makes it fun this was also one of the encounters that marcus's logical and like over tactical thinking might have hurt because i i know that i was big time like we have to do something with fire like throw fire at them whatever and i wasted at least one of my turns trying to do something with fire that wasn't as effective as just hitting it but that's what marcus would do so i mean marcus is desire to plan I had a lot of fun with uh daisy's desire to not follow the plan <laughs> <laughs> yes, you really should watch our playthrough if you haven't you really will like it <laughs> so there's some cool items here the adventure talks about you have the dread helm which is just one of those silly things that really does nothing but i like to have it get advantage on it an intimidation check here or there for something daisy loved it yeah, she, yes, that's one of those fun things. Gauntlets of Ogre Power, which is a really cool item, which just makes anybody have a strength of 19, which is just awesome. Uh, however, because Marcus and Daisy, we had a, you know, a fighter and a barbarian, and you both already had plus four strength modifiers, I didn't think that that was really fun. So instead of having the Gauntlets of Ogre Power, and also we had a bard who I felt like really wasn't getting as many... <laughs> <laughs> magic items as you could have i put a wand of magic missiles and a cloak of protection wasn't sure what you would do with the cloak of protection i kind of figured maybe that would go to landor but i knew for sure the wand would because he'd be the only one who could use it and then the cloak of protection was just one of those fun decision points that i thought you guys could could have fun with landor was like well i'm usually in the back so i'm, I'm gonna take the wand so i don't need it and then it was either we could make Izzy like slightly harder to hit or we could make Marcus impossible to hit because yeah. I think cloak of protection would have brought her like almost up to what his AC was just normally. I got to that like second bracket where it's just like you really have to have a, a high either roll very high or you have to have a high modifier to be able to hit this man. Yeah, you might have been hitting like 19 or so at that point, maybe eight, maybe yeah. 20. Yeah, yeah, I have an AC of 20. So at that point, it would have been 19. And this stuff is all in a chest, which, you know, there's a key that you find or a signet ring, basically, which unlocks this because you, it's basically the ruling nobles signet ring. But even if they don't find it, you know, there's the knock spell or if there's a thief or, or 
something like that in the group that can unlock chests with a DC 20 check, I believe it says. So there's multiple ways to succeed here. And it's story driven. You know, I like this adventure. It's got a good reason to, to be there. You know, the cryovain threat is real. Lean into cryovane doing things even if the, the group sees him or not because that's going to make that sense of urgency all all the more real and as far as like how dangerous this place is it's very saving throw heavy banshee <laughs> saving throws paralyzation saving throws poison saving throws restrain saving throws a lot of the danger here like if one of those goes bad it could get bad in a hurry for one of these characters and it feels appropriate for this kind of fight if you want a good combat quest, this is the one. It's going to challenge you, even if each individual encounter doesn't challenge you, the combination of the three, it's going to you know, push you to your limits. And whether you go with Jake's rewards or you go with the stock ones, I'd say you get rewarded for it. And the nice thing with this adventure as a whole is that it's one of those that feels important. It feels like you're in your end game, you're about to go do this thing, but you need to make sure everyone's protected before you do it. And I like that. So there are, of course, many different ways that you could make twists and turns and details on this adventure to go in a different direction. And I would love to hear any thoughts that you have on the matter, especially if you've run this adventure, because the comment section on these videos often ends up becoming a pretty cool resource where other people can come and watch this and get different ideas, advice and all that kind of thing. So Please like, comment, and subscribe. Tell us all about it. And then um, you really should watch our playthrough if you haven't already, because there's a lot of good fun times there. So thank you so much for watching, and we will catch you next time.